In this video, we will continue our discussion of all things blood sugar regulation and talk about the glycemic index and glycemic load, two concepts that are critical to understanding how the food that we eat affects our blood sugar levels. So after watching this video, you will be able to use the glycemic index of foods as one tool to keep your blood sugar levels stable and specifically to avoid major blood sugar spikes. At the end of the video, I will tell you how you can get a printable poster showing the glycemic index and glycemic load of many common uh, foods to help you concretely use the information I'm covering today. Make sure to watch to the end if you're interested in that. The terms glycemic index and glycemic load both relate to how much a food or a meal or a diet affects blood sugar levels. Think of them as scoring systems. The higher the number, the more the food or the meal will increase blood sugar levels. Let's first take a closer look at the glycemic index and how it's calculated. According to the current protocol for scientifically measuring the glycemic index of foods, participants must each come into a clinic on several occasions, always in the fasting state. Let's just assume that this participant here comes in on 15 different occasions throughout the month. Every time they come in, investigators prepare a meal for them that consists of just one carbohydrate-rich food. Each meal is calculated and prepared to contain exactly 50 grams of available carbohydrates. Available carbohydrates here means that these are the carbohydrates that are not fiber. On at least three of these visits, spaced apart a bit like, for example, this here, each participant is given the reference food. That reference food is a beverage containing 50 grams of pure glucose in a glass of water. Right before drinking this beverage, the researchers draw blood, and then they do this again repeatedly over two hours, with blood draws at least at 0, 15, 30, 45, 60, 90, and 120 minutes. You can probably imagine that blood sugar will rise quickly and quite a bit even in healthy people after drinking a beverage with 50 grams of pure glucose. So let's imagine the blood sugar response of our participant to drinking 50 grams of glucose looks like this here. Investigators then calculate the area under the glucose curve above the baseline glucose concentration. We also call this the incremental area under the curve. Here in blue, this is what this may look like. This is then repeated two more times with the glucose beverage, and then researchers average the three areas under the curve. That average is then set to 100, because by convention 50 grams of pure glucose has a glycemic index of 100. On the other occasions, the participant comes in, they are given 50 grams of available carbohydrates from other foods. For example, they may be given white rice, brown rice, bananas, white bread, whole grain bread, oatmeal made from quick oats, oatmeal made from steel cut oats, potatoes, corn, kidney beans, ice cream, and quinoa. Again, participants eat 50 grams of available carbohydrates from each of these foods. The researchers draw blood repeatedly and calculate the area under the curve for each. So let's assume this here is the curve after eating brown rice in red. Let's assume this red area under the curve was 66% of the one in blue, the blue being the average of three separate tests with 50 grams of pure glucose. Then the glycemic index of brown rice for this one person would be 66. Now the glycemic index of a food is not determined from the data of one person. So worldwide this exact experiment may have been repeated in dozens or hundreds of people. And then the glycemic index of brown rice is set as the average of all of these individual tests. One thing that always leads to confusion is that everyone has different glucose responses in general. So how can we come up with one glycemic index for a food? I think this is an important point, so let me explain. In general, by the most recent standard, the glycemic index is based on the glucose response in healthy people who don't have diabetes or prediabetes. So this already reduces differences between people. But even if person A, let's say, has a substantially smaller glucose response to, say, brown rice, than person B, it is likely that person A also has a substantially smaller response to the glucose beverage than person B, and so the relationship between the red area relative to the blue area may be similar in both people. 
Differences between people still remain. So if the overall glycemic index for brown rice is 66, it may be 62 for one person and 73 for another. Therefore, you need to think about the glycemic index as the average glucose response you can expect from a food relative to 50 grams of pure glucose. Let's take a look at the glycemic index of a few foods. Let me say right away, though, that the glycemic index should not be understood as a ranking system of the health effects of a food. It's just a ranking system of the glycemic effects of a food, that is, how much a food raises blood sugar levels. In other words, it gives us information about one aspect of a food. It doesn't mean that a food with a higher glycemic index is automatically less healthy. Now, I realize that this may be confusing to some of you. And you may wonder why we're even talking about this if it isn't a ranking of the overall healthfulness of a food. The reason is that, in my opinion, there cannot be an overall ranking of the healthfulness of foods. Every food, or let me correct that, every whole food that has not been subjected to ultra-processing has some benefits and some potential downsides. So what I am hoping is that we all start to move away from this idea that we should look for a food that is perfect in all regards. Back to the glycemic index. We have glycemic index data only for foods that contain a meaningful amount of carbohydrates. Meats or eggs or fish, for example, have so few carbohydrates, basically none, that one cannot practically determine their glycemic index. We're not going to talk about these foods here, but that is only because they don't really have a meaningful acute impact on blood sugar levels. So you're not making a mistake if you think of them as having a glycemic index of zero or close to zero. That's very different for grains. Let's take a look at a few types of grains and their glycemic indices. You'll have some with a very high glycemic index, such as white jasmine rice at 89, instant oatmeal at 82, cornflakes at 80, and white wheat bread at 73. With these, you get a blood sugar response almost as high as with pure sugar water. Not good. The grains category provides some better options, though. For example, the glycemic index of brown rice or parboiled rice is about a third lower than that of white jasmine rice. Oatmeal made from rolled or steel-cut oats also has a substantially lower glycemic index than instant oatmeal. And sourdough rye bread with a glycemic index of 54 compares favorably with white wheat bread at 73. By the way, underneath each food you see two numbers. One here, GI, that's the glycemic index, and that's what we're focusing on now. The second one is GL, the glycemic load. We're going to talk about that next, and that will help you uh, interpret what this means. Another category in which we find many foods with a high glycemic index is tubers. Baked white or sweet potatoes, for example, come in at 88. Meshed potatoes at 77 and french fries at 65. Lower glycemic index options in this category include boiled sweet potatoes at 46 and carrots at 32. A third category in which we find high glycemic index foods are sweets and snack foods. No surprise here, I guess. Looking at fruit and berries, some also have a fairly high glycemic index. Dried fruit, such as raisins, for example, at 59, pineapple at 58, blueberries at 53 and grapes at 52. This sounds high, but before you stop eating fruit, wait until we talk about the so-called glycemic load in a few minutes. Also, there are lower glycemic index options, such as strawberries at 40 or pears at 29. Consistently, relatively low glycemic index values can be found among dairy foods and among legumes and nuts. Low-fat milk has a glycemic index of 27, Plain yogurt of 26 and even flavored and sweetened commercial yogurt is not all that high at 31 for low fat and 35 for full fat. Even full fat ice cream has a glycemic index of only 38. This is a good reminder of what I talked about earlier. Just because a food has a fairly low glycemic index does not mean that it's a health food. Then there's a category in which I've grouped legumes and nuts. Lentils come in at 42. Kidney beans have a glycemic index of 40 and chickpeas of 37. Mixed nuts have a glycemic index of 24. Let's move on and talk about the glycemic load and how that is calculated. Now, I personally find the glycemic index useful, but it does have one important limitation. The glycemic index is always based on 50 grams of available carbohydrates from each food. 
And that's actually nice in that it makes it easy to get a sense of how much each food raises blood sugar levels compared to others, assuming that the exact same amount of available carbohydrates are eaten. But that exactly is the limitation. Foods differ a lot in the carbohydrate content, and one would need to eat only small amounts of certain foods, but unrealistically huge amounts of others to get to 50 grams of available carbohydrates. For example, table sugar is a pure carbohydrate, and so we would need to eat only 50 grams of that. At the same time, we would need to eat about 175 grams of white rice, or 431 grams of apple, that's more than two large apples, or more than one kilogram, or more than a liter, of full-fat yogurt to get to 50 grams of available carbohydrates. That is because these foods contain a lot less carbohydrates. Whereas table sugar is 100% carbs, full-fat yogurt contains less than 5% carbs. To take the differences in carbohydrate content of foods into consideration, researchers have developed the glycemic load. In simple terms, the glycemic load is the product of the glycemic index of a food and the grams of available carbohydrates in that food. By convention, this is then divided by 100 to make the numbers a bit smaller. So table sugar has a glycemic index of 66. A typical serving of table sugar is one teaspoon, about five grams, and these contain five grams of available carbohydrates. Using this formula here, the glycemic load of one teaspoon of table sugar is three. For white rice, the glycemic index is 60. A typical serving size is about 160 grams, which contains about 45 grams of available carbohydrates. This leads to a glycemic load of 27. Here now you can see how the glycemic load is useful. The glycemic load of white rice of 27 is nine times as much as that of a teaspoon of table sugar. This means that we can expect a similar glucose response to a serving of white basmati rice as to nine teaspoons of table sugar. One of the reasons why nutritionists and dietitians are not that excited about refined grains such as white rice or white flour bread is that they are not that different from eating pure sugar. It's just starch, which are chains of pure glucose, and they're easily digested, so they enter the bloodstream very quickly after eating them. Apples have a glycemic index of 44, which seems pretty high. However, serving size for an apple is about 150 grams, which contains only 15 grams of available carbohydrates, leading to a glycemic load number of 7. Similarly, we can calculate the glycemic load for full-fat yogurt and arrive at 3. So what you can readily see is that you could eat a lot of apples and yogurt and still have a lower blood sugar response than you'd get from a single serving of white rice. As it happens right now, I have plain yogurt with a small apple and a handful of nuts for breakfast most days. And check out these changes in my sugar levels. Here, on this day, I had breakfast pretty late at 11 a.m. Before the meal, my sugar level was 105 milligrams per deciliter because I had already had a few cups of tea with milk. After the meal, it rose very gradually to about 115 mg per deciliter and then returned to around 90 mg per deciliter. To make this information useful for you, I've created a little poster that you can get for free. The link is in the description below. To wrap it up, let me give you the main points. First, the glycemic index is a measure of how much a food raises blood sugar levels compared to the same amount of carbohydrates from pure glucose. In a way, you can think about it as a percentage, because the glycemic response to glucose is always set to 100, and all other foods are compared to that. Therefore, a glycemic index of, say, 80, means that a food raises blood sugar levels 20% less than pure glucose. A glycemic index of 40 means 60% less than pure glucose. Second, the glycemic load is a measure of how much a typical serving of a food affects blood sugar levels. Consuming one serving of a food or meal with a glycemic load of 10 is expected to raise blood sugar twice as much as one serving of a food or meal with a glycemic load of 5. Now, why is it that foods have such vastly different glycemic indices, even if they contain similar amounts of carbohydrates? And is there any evidence that eating a low glycemic index diet or a low glycemic load diet matters for our long-term health? These two questions will be answered in the next video. Until then, please leave a comment if you have any questions, and consider leaving a like if this video was helpful. Also, if you're interested in evidence-based information about nutrition for the prevention of chronic diseases, please consider subscribing to the channel. Appreciate you watching the video. Thank you very much for your interest. Bye-bye.